Good morning. Uh, I suppose just to start in terms of my current role, I'm now working as a reduce and restrictive practice lead for Signet Healthcare. That's one of two posts across uh, Signet as an organisation. I've been a MAPA certified instructor now for 11 years, but in terms of the context of the presentation, it's important to say that I've been a control and restraint trainer for nine years prior to that. Uh, my background up until May of this year is 26 years working in specialist mental health and deafness services. Uh, as a qualified nurse, my last role was working as a nurse consultant specialising in mental health and deafness. When I was asked to do this presentation, uh, I was asked to take you through my MAPA journey. But my MAPA journey actually commenced prior to moving to a MAPA model. So I'm going to give you some background about the process in terms of when I worked for a particular organisation how we moved from a control and restraint model to a MAPA model. I'm going to look at practice and training challenges. So I'm really going to focus on some challenges, particularly in relation to my specialised field, which is mental health and deafness, both from a deaf service user perspective, but also a deaf staff perspective. And like I said, I'm going to look later on at some of the organisational challenges. What I will look at is how we overcame those challenges. And at the end of the presentation, I'll talk about some of the achievements that I believe uh, as an organisation have been um, successes because of the impact of the MAPA model. So, Signet Healthcare uh, has about 20 hospitals across England. Uh, they specialise in a range of inpatient mental health services. The reason I've identified Berry and uh, Sheffield is that Signet Healthcare um, is primarily a PMBA model, but the Berry and Sheffield hospitals are currently delivering a MAPA model of training. So the Berry Hospital, uh, I've worked at the Berry Hospital uh, from 2001. It's by far the largest Signet Hospital. It consists of 15 wards. There's 10 adult wards and five adolescent wards. The adult wards are lot rehabilitation, low secure, medium secure wards. The adolescent wards, four out of the five wards are PICU services. It's actually three times larger than any other Signet Hospital. It's about 160 beds now. Importantly, it's on the Berry Hospital site where I suppose I've worked for the last 15 years, but that's where the specialist deaf services are based. And there's two deaf male low secure wards, and there's a, de a deaf female low secure ward, and a deaf so deaf female medium secure ward. The female wards are, are integrated, whereas the male wards are deaf only wards. So, outline for the session. Uh, I've spoken about, I'll take you through, from a deaf service perspective, how we've addressed some challenges with deaf service users, particularly when they present with risk behavior and physical interventions are needed and how we overcame those challenges. But also look at the importance of having deaf staff within an organisation. And we'll think about that as a whole, certainly in terms of positive behaviour support, but also in terms of the crisis development model. I'm going to touch on a new project that Signet are involved in with CPI around supporting deaf learners on MAPA courses. And as I've said later on, uh, I'll talk about sort of organisational challenges and achievements. So to give some context to, I suppose, deafness and mental health deafness before I move on to the projects that I've been involved in, there's actually 6.7 million people, these are estimates, that would benefit from a hearing aid in the UK. And one in six people 
have some degree of hearing loss. 900,000 people have a severe or a profound hearing loss. According to the 2011 census, there are 24,000 deaf BSL users. Now, when I'm talking about specialist mental health and deafness services, primarily we are working with deaf service users who are using BSL as their main mode of language. So that group of people, they, are, they have a shared culture, a shared community, they've got a very positive deaf identity. One of the things that bonds them together is a shared common language, which is British Sign Language. And you can see from there that you know, British Sign Language is a language in its own right. It's recognised nationally now. I think a lot of people will know that it's a very visual, gestural language. Now, we've got a map of, map of trainers sat here, Steve, in the audience. As in addition to being a map of certified instructor, is actually a qualified BSL interpreter and, and currently works for us on the very site. I think importantly that a lot of people don't know it. It has. It is not dependent on English language, and there's no. It's not linked to sort of spoken English language, and there's no written form of BSL. So if we're communicating using written English with a deaf person, that can be inaccessible for a lot of deaf people because it's not the first language. In terms of specialist services, I mentioned the specialist services at, um, at Berry, but the first inpatient mental health and deafness service opened in 1968 at Whittingham Hospital. And uh, that was an open service, a non-secure service. That's actually the place I started my journey back in 1990 when I qualified as a mental health nurse. And the Whittingham Hospital unit relocated to Manchester in 1993. There's now three open mental health and deafness units at Manchester, Birmingham and London. There's been secure services for deaf people since 2001 and there's low, medium and maximum secure services for deaf people and there's a range now of community and residential services for deaf people. So thinking about the challenges from a deaf service user perspective, in essence, what we're going to think about first of all is that when we were using a control and restraint model back in, I suppose, the mid-late, mid-1990s, from a physical intervention perspective, there were major communication barriers if we were restraining a deaf service user group. So thinking about CNR, there was one level of hold they couldn't, uh, deaf service users could not communicate expressively. There was implications for deaf staff involved in a restraint team. And also from a receptive perspective, the model that we were using, there were, very, there were major barriers to communication in terms of the visual field. So my journey started in 1990, like I said. When I worked at Whittingham Hospital, I remember that uh, those first few years, up until 1993, we had no model of management of violence and aggression training. In 1993, I remember attending my first control and restraint course. The Whittingham unit, like I said, had moved to Manchester. I was a participant on that course. That was a pain compliance course. And some of us here, looking at Albert Rose, will remember those courses. And in terms of pain compliance, we weren't only talking about flexion on wrists. We were talking about nipping on inner arms, nipping on the tops of legs to get compliance. I can see one or two people nodding. Because I worked in a specialist deaf services, and because at that time everything was about physical interventions, unfortunately, I was nominated to become a control and restraint trainer, and I attended a control and restraint train the trainers course in 1996. But again, that whole course was about physical interventions, and the challenges from a deaf service user perspective continued 
to present themselves. So you can see, uh, I'm a bit younger there, that's in 2007. And one or two of you might, uh, thank you. One or two of you might uh, recognize Jennifer Drabble, who's uh, one of our certified instructors. But Peter there is a deaf service, well he's a deaf professional, but he's taken on the role of a deaf service user. Uh, and, and straight away, I think the barrier is both expressively for him to communicate and receptively in terms of a visual field, given that he has to use his hands, uh, are, are very apparent. Even in what we now sort of will talk about, the safest position, the seated position, in terms of control and restraint, it was always a three-person team. There was always someone on the head, and again, there was only one high level of intervention. And from a deaf service user perspective, again, uh, very difficult to communicate. We did a lot of work around sort of four-person and five-person teams. So we'd look at the role of a communicator or the role of an interpreter to support that scenario. But it continued to present challenges in terms of, I suppose, what this conference today is about, which is effective interventions. I, throughout the late 1990s, developed an interest in forensic mental health and deafness. Uh, there was a lot of discussion in the late 1990s about opening NHS secure mental health and deafness beds. It didn't happen. And in 2001, on the Berry site, an independent company called Mayflower Hospitals uh, purchased 16 acres of land. And we opened up the first medium secure inpatient deaf service in the UK and probably at that time anywhere in the world and we opened up a 10 bed medium secure ward. Like I said those services have developed since then. Uh, there's more deaf beds and the service is now 15 wards consisting of hearing and deaf services. We opened up the Mayflower service. I actually was the head of nursing at that time and that was significant because for the first time, I had some influence in terms of looking at our model of violence and aggression training. Also, it's important to mention that there was, I suppose, a partner organisation called Deafway, which is a rehabilitation facility for deaf people in Preston. And their deputy chief executive, John Williams, was also a control and restraint trainer and was presented with similar challenges. We remained unhappy with the model. We set up a project group about 2001 involving Mayflower Hospitals and involving Deathway. And that included people like myself, John Williams, Rose, who sat over there uh, as, as, as a previous control and restraint trainer and a MAPA trainer. But we also involved deaf professionals uh, and we involved interpreters that have been involved in sort of control and restraint delivery to look at what the issues are. And we highlighted those issues sort of nationally at that time because as you remember, if, as you remember sort of in 2001, there was a lot of high profile cases like the Rocky Bennett inquiry. We, uh, as a project group, developed a paper called Seeing Our Techniques and Deaf People. And in 2004 was the last nice consultation and we actually submitted that paper to that consultation process that was referenced in the consultation document. And there was also reference in the consultation document and the 2005 NICE guidance around challenges to communication when restraining deaf people. It was at that time that we were presenting at conferences. I remember we presented at the General Services Conference and we started to look at other models of training that might overcome some of these challenges. And we met key people. I remember meeting Malcolm Ray, who was in work for the Department of Health. He was advising on national standards around management of violence and aggression at that time. And uh, it was Malcolm that sort of, with a colleague, pointed us in the direction of uh, Albert and uh, Mark West at the time and in 2004 we had a series of meetings which ultimately 
resulted in moving from a CNR model to a mapper model. I should have mentioned that between 2001 and 2005, Mayflower also bought the Sheffield Hospital. Uh, so it was Berry and Sheffield that moved over to a mapper model. So as we can all, well, we all know here, straight away, uh, and the uh, same scenario, low-level hold, Peter has got expressive communication, he's got a visual field to receive communication. In terms of a medium level hold, again, which we're all familiar with, you know, we're able to communicate effectively with him. Again, work has been done because, you know, potentially if a third person is needed, then we need to make sure that Peter always has access to a visual field and to communication. But the mapper model allowed from a physical intervention perspective expressive communication and effective communication for a deaf service user. So I suppose in addition to that, the rationale for moving from CNR to MAPR at that time was straight away the person-centeredness of the model uh, was, was uh, very apparent. Again, there was uh, a lot of emphasis in terms of pressure for change at that time and the national agenda around management of violence and aggression and MAPA was very much at the forefront of national standards at that time. That range of physical interventions was key from a sort of deaf service perspective. It included non-physical skills training, and again, that's obviously increased over the last 10 years. What was key was there was a robust system and regulation system for trainers, which was not in place when we were teaching a control and restraint model. It was fit for purpose. Uh, we were a forensic service and that was key. And again, in 2005, it's important to point out that we weren't only a deaf service, we were a hearing service as well. And it met the needs of both client groups. Deaf service user feedback is important. Uh, in 2011, uh, one or two of you remember that at a positive options networking event, we presented some practical workshops on this material. And, as, and that involved myself, it involved John Williams, and it involved two of our deaf professionals. And one of the deaf professionals, Luke, actually spoke to a number of deaf service users who had been familiar with the CNR model and the MAPA model. And the feedback that he got, first of all, straight away was around improved communication, but also comments like communicated respect. It actually increased after used non-physical skills rather than physical intervention skills. In terms of the deaf service users themselves, one or two commented that it allowed them to test out their own strategies around managing their own behaviour. But what was really striking was how empowering and liberating they felt compared to the previous model that they've been subjected to. So that, that was the first project, and you know, that's absolutely key in terms of my mapper journey because it was, it was that challenge that drove us initially from moving from a control and restraint model to a mapper model. I wanted to briefly mention, uh, before I go on to the organisational challenge, um, a, a, a new project that uh, the Deaf Service at Bury at Signet Healthcare are involved in with CPI which is looking at making the new MAPPER programme more accessible for deaf learners. So as we're aware, we've been uh, delivering a workbook orientated programme since 2013. Now, from a sort of deaf staff perspective, that presents quite significant challenges because we're presenting a much stronger English-based information in terms of PowerPoint in terms of workbooks, pre-test, post-test. What we are uh, looking at is how we can present information to deaf learners 
in BSL so that they get the same access and it's as meaningful as it would be to us if we were hearing learners. From a workbook perspective, uh, what we're saying is that we've got to remember that the workbook is a resource. Uh, so if a deaf learner wants to access the workbook, they can do that. And depending on your individual deaf member as staff and their level of English will be dependent on how accessible that workbook is to them. But we don't want to create additional stress of a workbook which might impact on their learning. So the two areas that we've started working on is with the expertise within the communication team and the deaf service that are familiar with the mapper model is to develop some good practice guidelines for mapper certified instructors. And that's very much around working with BSL interpreters in terms of the planning of courses, during courses, and how a debrief process can involve deaf learners to support that process. We're also looking at a, a translation of the mapper glossary at the end of the workbooks. So we're looking at developing a BSL version of that to support deaf learners, and that might be via a link. So we're just going to spend about one minute looking at an edited clip of a very rough version of the crisis development model in BSL, because if you think about the crisis development model, there's a number of terms within that that will be included within the glossary. Initially, we were going to look at an alphabetical glossary in BSL, but we've decided to go unit by unit because from a deaf learner perspective, it does them give them the context of the terms that are being used, which adds meaning and adds to their understanding. So we're just going to, this is highly edited. It's very raw and it will be refilmed, but it's just to give you a flavor of where we're going with this. What I didn't mention was uh, the importance of deaf staff. So we've talked about deaf learners from MAPA program, but in terms of deaf services, and, and, and certainly at Mayflower Hospitals, which uh, is now Signet Healthcare, we employ about 30 to 40 deaf staff, and I just wanted to em emphasize the importance of deaf staff. So working with a deaf service user group, if you're thinking about the crisis development model, in terms of having that shared language with a deaf service user group, that's been absolutely key in all aspects of their care. But certainly when we've got deaf people that are presented as frustrated, anxious, within a sort of inpatient mental health and deafness service, and there's a lot of evidence to support this, there's quite a high level of cognitive deficit, and that's often linked to their cause of deafness. So. You know, having deaf uh, members of staff, they're often much more able to adapt their own language register to meet that individual's needs and support that de-escalation process. So obviously, in all aspects, 24-7, having deaf members of staff within the team is important, but certainly supports that.
keep on the fence on that person in first year is how I've packed the stuff yeah. and what does it mean to be in the British Sign Language because the, the common theme is there isn't a, a word or a, a sign language for it. So how do you go about that in using your training or what is, what is it to say something? Uh. <laughs> I think it's interesting because it's the it's the sort of non-verbal communication module that we're looking at at the moment, and uh, one of the things that that's absolutely key to this process is that we will be consulting with other deaf services, and I'm aware that St Andrews have got a secure service as well. Uh, and I suppose from from my perspective, it, it's all in the BSL description of the meaning of what haptics is. So I think even as I'll speak personally, in 2013, I'd never come across the word haptics. And I can see one or two people nodding away. Uh, but it's very much about us communicating the meaning related to that. And I think that's got to come over in the BSL translation. So rather than look at haptics, we've got to be clear about the meaning. Now, w what we are fortunate to have is we've got a deaf professional who's a communication and translation specialist who who has a lot of experience around translating English into BSL. So at this stage, I haven't got the answer to that question, but more than willing to keep you informed and uh, maybe consult about that. Um, um, actually, similar to what you just said, because we have similar problems where I work as well. Yeah. Um, and our signers found it quite difficult to actually work with us as trainers yeah. whilst we're actually delivering to people and yeah. then try to fully understand what we've been yeah. saying. And, and, and on that, we, we've already, uh, and, and we've had meetings with Chris Sterling, developed sort of draft guidelines to support trainers, but also to, to support BSL interpreters. It's involved deaf professionals as well around making that as accessible as possible. And, you know, just looking at a PowerPoint, if you're a deaf person, you can't look at a PowerPoint and look at a BSL interpreter at the same time. So there's some, there's some tips to effective communication. So I'll move on. That, but I'm more than happy to discuss those things as the day goes on. Okay, uh, I think I need about another 15 minutes, I hope. So, uh, so challenges, organisational challenges. Uh, Mayflower Hospitals, I said we moved over to a mapper model in 2005. I remember I was with Albert Mark West at... Uh, Westcliff Hospital, was it, in Stoke? And I'd just become a MAPA certified instructor. Very proud to be a MAPA instructor. And I got a phone call saying, Alpha Hospitals have purchased Mayflower Hospitals. Now, when Alpha Hospitals purchased um, Mayflower Hospitals, they purchased the Berry and Sheffield Hospitals. Alpha Hospitals already had a hospital in Woking. One of the challenges was, was the Woking Hospital didn't use a MAPA model, it used an MBA model, and the executive management team for Alpha were based at Woking. There was a big organisational review, as you would expect, when a new company purchases another company. Uh, unfortunately, the executive management team asked two nurse directors who were independent, uh, allegedly, independent, but they were, they were not familiar with a MAPA model. They were, they were familiar with an NDA or a control and restraint model. And I thought, just to say, that was the starting point of a number of organisational challenges, and particularly at that time, attending probably some of the most difficult meetings that I've been involved in around attempting to justify the MAPA model. Those challenges, uh, and looking at people like Albert uh, and Chris, have been ongoing. Uh, if, I, I suppose one of my points is training is not everything, but from an executive management team perspective, it did seem to be everything. It's obviously significant, but if we had any practice issues, for example, uh, people getting injured in restraint, uh, maybe a serious incident, it was very much about the model not being fit for purpose. So there's at least one, if not two occasions, when we did have practice issues that were involving either positive options, as it was at that time, or CPI, to support us in addressing those practice issues. 
That culminated, uh, to cut a long story short, in 2014 when uh, Alpha Hospitals, David Sheffield and Woking decided that they planned on moving to one model of training and uh, set up what they called a restraint review. And that involved uh, myself, Albert and Chris presenting on the mapper model, but it also involved a another model of training and a team presenting on their model. Uh, what, what, I, what I will say is that we're still continuing to teach mapper, but again, uh, very difficult in terms of that level of challenge. Martin mentioned the six core strategy before. Uh, and I remember at that meeting that Chris also referred to the six core strategy and, and he did emphasize a lot around training transfer. But what was really useful in that meeting and the executive management team were very much present within that meeting was to present a framework whereby they were able to see that in terms of our overall strategy to provide good quality care, it just wasn't about training. So we were able to communicate the importance of leadership, importance of service user involvement, continuous improvement, you mentioned positive behaviour support, people being involved in all aspects of their care. I actually suspect at that time that the, pro the uh, process of Signet Healthcare purchasing Alpha may have started, which may have been a reason no decision was made from that restraint review, and we've continued to teach MAPA. So, I suppose, in, in summary, that's most of my journey. Uh, when I was asked to present about my mapper journey, I was, I was sort of thinking about myself as a certified instructor, but I was thinking about all of us uh, here as certified instructors. And as Martin said, I, was, I felt very fortunate last year to see Kevin Ann Huxhorn present at the Restraint Reduction Network conference. And she didn't only present about the six core strategies, she also presented on the foundation principles that underpin those strategies and I could relate to those as a professional as a nurse and as a certified instructor and I felt that not, well I'd hope all of us here can relate to those so I just wanted to point those out so she spoke about leadership and all of us here have got roles as leaders we're influencing change in some cases we're trying to change cultures Prevention is absolutely key, and Martin's touched on that this morning, and there's a much greater emphasis on prevention, and that's very much about my role. Uh, you know, the training is a small part of it. In terms of MAPA, it's a much bigger picture to support that prevention model. Values are absolutely key. You know, I'm very aware of my own values. I'm sure we share the same values, but again, it's how we treat our service user group, but also, importantly, how we treat our staff group. Recovery and resilience. What, one of the strengths uh, in terms of my role as a nurse consultant was that I was very proud at the level of service user involvement within the deaf service. When we had verification visits as part of our MAPA approved training centre arrangements, we were often complimented on our governance arrangements, but also the level of service user involvement, and that's absolutely key. Understanding about trauma. Again, it's a developing area. Again, I've been very fortunate. Iris Benson, who's an expert service user by experience, presented at last year's conference. I think she's presenting at this year's conference as well. Very powerful, very passionate around the impact of restraint in terms of re-traumatizing her as a person, but also talks very passionately about co-production. And Iris is actually on the project board for Signet Healthcare around the Reduce and Restrictive Practice Strategy that I've been involved in delivering. And again, I've, I've worked alongside Iris over the last few months and that's given me massive insight about trauma-informed care. Whatever you read in books doesn't really communicate the importance 
when you actually work alongside someone who's experienced that trauma and has been re-traumatised by her experiences as a service user in hospital. And quality improvement. I hope what I'm talking about today is very much around changing practice, changing cultures, and not just about impacting on a deaf service, but the role now is about impacting on an organisation. So I'm coming to the end now. We deliver a bill credit to the cur curriculum, as we all do. Uh, we think it's absolutely key, and Martin summed that up very well this morning. You know, we became a MAPA approved training centre in 2008, and we've consistently achieved excellent verification reports. And I think it's really interesting that when we were challenged by the executive management team at Alpha Hospitals, if we had external scrutiny via Care Quality Commission, Quality Network, which is a body that scrutinises secure services, they would be the first people to fly that verification report saying, we demonstrate excellent practice around management of violence and aggression. We've got trusted partner status in terms of meeting the build accreditation standards. I've already mentioned the new MAPA program. I think we need to celebrate success. So Steve Martin here, if you stand, if you sort of stand up, Steve. <laughs> okay, just to embarrass him. But but Steve, Steve's uh, like. On the Berry site, we've got eight certified instructors. On the Sheffield site, we've got two certified instructors. But we've got Steve and Diane Todd on the Berry site that have both achieved the restraint reduction degree. And I, know, I think we really need to highlight that. And uh, what I'd like to say, we continue to work with CPI, and I think that's very important because CPI as an organisation are working collaboratively with other organisations to enhance the model and the product that they are delivering, which is absolutely key in terms of that ongoing quality improvement. The reducing restricted practice strategy, when we were alpha hospitals, I led on the development of the reducing restricted practice strategy. We worked with Chris, he supported us in terms of developing that strategy based on the work he had done with other trusts. We joined the Restraint Reduction Network, which provided us with a, vision, a mission, values and principles around our own strategy. But that was absolutely key when Signet Healthcare purchased Alpha Hospitals last August, because that actually gave them strategic direction. And CPI have continued to support Signet in terms of implementing the strategy that we've now got in place. It's based on the six core strategies uh, that's already been mentioned. The project board, the, uh, on the Restraint Reduction Network, uh, sits our uh, uh, Signet Healthcare's nurse director, Julie Kerry. She's a sort of nursing director and patient experience lead for Signet. But on that sort of executive management level, that is ownership of the strategy is, ab is absolutely key. But I did mention that Iris is on the project board, but also there is another service user on the project board. So at all levels, there is service user involvement. That's me receiving my Meritorious Instructor Award. I'm not going to dwell on that, because that's not why I've put it up. I wanted just to mention, and this is the very last thing, my Meritorious Instructors so the definition of a meritorious instructor is to shape new initiatives that's demonstrated unwavering enthusiasm and dedication in supporting vulnerable people in his care and supporting his colleagues and fellow MAPA instructors. So I've mentioned John Williams, who was key in terms of working with myself around two organisations, Deathway and Mayflower at that time, moving from a CNR model to a MAPA model. I suppose we've actually impacted on four organisations, if you include Alpha Hospitals and now Signet Healthcare. Albert and Chris, I'm not going to embarrass them, but I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the support that I've received throughout those organisational challenges. That's been absolutely key, and I'm very grateful for that. But I suppose it's at this point I'm going to finish the presentation, <laughs> because the last person that I want to mention is Rose Mercer Brown. So can I ask Rose to come to the front, please? Come on, please.
There's, there's road just to embarrass her even further. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, myself and Albert. <laughs> it's, this is your life, Rose. This is your so, life. So, what, what, what I'm, I'm not allowed to mention Rose's age, but she retired 14 years ago when she was 57. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, the reason we wanted to bring Rose up here today is that uh, I'm going to allow Albert to talk about when he first met Rose, but I first met Rose in the early 1990s at Presswich Hospital. And as a trainer, when I became a control and restraint trainer in 1996, Rose was already a control and restraint trainer. And uh, at that time was my role model and in many ways has continued to be my role model. Uh, so I think when we look at the, the definition, there's definitely an unwavering enthusiasm. And the fact that at whatever her age is, she is still going as a MAPA trainer, I think is all credit to her. And she works passionately with vulnerable service users. She's got a background in secure adolescent services as a nurse specialist. But again, in terms of being open to change, has moved from a control and restraint model. She was involved in the deaf service project. And for the last 11 years, like myself, has been a MAPA trainer uh, and has continued to deliver more MAPA training uh, at uh, <coughs> Signet Healthcare as it is now than any other trainer and is an excellent role model for all staff in terms of it's not just about size, gender, moving totally away from that old macho model. I've actually uh, put a picture up there, which is the, uh, I, I, I describe those like a Duracell battery <laughs> because she's got loads and loads of energy. She keeps going. And uh, the reason we're here today is that this year, Rose has just said that it's going to be her last year. Uh, I think she's hoping to move to Spain next year. So uh, we just wanted to acknowledge that fact that as the oldest mapper trainer in the world, <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just in terms of her dedication to MAPA, uh, was, was, was just to sort of mention that today because we felt it was really important. We've asked Rose here today for that reason. I'm going to hand over to Albert now. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Uh, what makes this doubly sad is the second oldest map train in the world is about to say goodbye to the oldest map train in the world. Um, just, just very quickly, I first met Rose, I think it was the mid-60s, at Broadmoor Hospital, and I knew immediately when I met her I could help this lady. I could get her to a better place. <laughs> With the right treatment and the right support, she could live an independent life and provide a good service to society. What a success she's been. Um, I met Rose, we, we, we actually done the very first control and restraint course delivered in the health service at Broadmoor Hospital under the auspices of the Home Office then. It was a brutal experience, but an invaluable experience. And we kept in contact for a few years, then we drifted apart. And then we re-hooked up with Rose back uh, when Nick mentioned the fact that when you came to the Huffcombe Clinic to Mark West and I. And when Alpha came down, or Mayflower as it was then came down, the conversation I had with Mark West, if Rose Mercer Brown buys into this, we've got a winner here because no one's going to test it more, check it out more, before she signs up to it. And she did, and she has. Um, I think Rose has been a fantastic advocate, not only for MAPA, but for clinical practice. She's got a vast experience, uh, not only talking about doing the job, but actually doing the job. And I will personally miss her an awful lot when she moves off to retirement. Um, I think CPI and the MAPA world will be much the poorer without you, but we're also been enriched for having spent time with you. And we've just got a little token we'd like to give you, Rose. Uh, trust me, it's not, it, it won't get stolen. Uh, <laughs> it's a certificate. And, and if it does get stolen, they will quickly return it. <laughs> and also a bunch of flowers. This is from CPI and MAPA. Thank you, Rose. You may, you may not have heard that, but Rose has just threatened to kill Nick. Um, it's nice to see that some things don't change. Take care, Rose. Thank you.